I want to read a scripture that we read last week. Actually, Mary read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Last week we discussed victory over death. That was our subject. Of course, we know that Jesus had victory over death. Amen. He rose from the dead and uh, he walked in the resurrection power that he now bestows to us. But along with that death, there came other victories that we receive. And one of those is victory over sin, which is my title today. I like the graphic there. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm assuming that we're the white and that's the black that's down. Just saying that because that's what it looks like. I'm thinking that, you know, being darkness is is defeated. Amen. How many know that sin has no control over us, but it can control us if we allow it to? It doesn't have the authority to control us, but we can give it the authority and allow it to control us. So we're going to be looking at some passages today, and we're going to go start right where we left off last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll read verse number 56. It says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, as we're going to see as we read the Scriptures today, uh, a lot of of what Paul wrote about was the fact that the law basically was just a schoolmaster to teach us that we needed God. Because without the law, we would have never known that there was any sin. So the strength of basically... The strength of sin is the law because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't know about it. But then, for whatever reason there is, and you guys know this as well as I do, if you're told not to do something, it makes you want to do it all that much more. Don't eat that apple off of that tree over there. Amen? And what did he go do? They went and ate the, went and ate the fruit. We, uh, we have a, temp, uh, uh, a tendency to lean towards rebellion. And we see this from a child growing up, amen? We see that kids who, now don't you touch that. Don't you touch that. Don't, I told you, I told you, don't you touch that. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, and, and, and you know, a little discipline helps to correct that sort of behavior. And that's kind of what happens with us. Because we're willing to put our hand right on the hot stove of sin and get burned. But God wants to turn the oven off. Amen. He wants you to know you don't have to turn on the, uh, the flame and burn yourselves. Because we actually have victory over it. Now, the sting of death is sin. Now, he says in verse 55, where is your sting? Well, he's saying where it is. It's in sin. Now, we're going to look at a lot of passages today, but let's read the next verse. It says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a person in this room who cannot stop sinning if they want to, if they choose to, if they will to, because it takes choices, it takes our will, It takes certain things that we're going to look at today to be able to overcome sin. Now, Jesus has already provided the victory. He gave us the power of his Holy Spirit to be able to stand against the temptations of this world. He was tempted in every same way that we are, yet without sin, because he walked in the power of God. He walked in the knowledge of God. He had the understanding of his purpose on this earth. And he fulfilled it. And each one of us can do the same thing. Because as we saw last week, he was the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I don't know about you. A lot of people, they grow up and they want to be like dad. Well, Jesus was like dad. He told Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. The things that he did, he did because of what he knew about his dad. Well, we can do the same thing. Now, because we're to imitate Christ, we do what he did, and we act the way he did, because that's the pattern. And then followers who follow us imitate us, according to what Paul told Timothy. There's supposed to be a follow-through on this. We have the victory. 
Think about that. You have the victory. You already have the victory. You're not walking in the victory, maybe. Now, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. We know that. But we can't use that as an excuse to sin. We have to be able to say, I have the victory over sin. I can stop any time I want to. And he goes on and says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren... See, he's not writing to heathen. He's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. He's writing to people who know God. He's not writing to somebody who doesn't know God, and he's telling them to stop sinning. Believers sin, amen? Now, it says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we will confess our sins and repent, he's faith, he's just, he's faith, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He will forgive us. But I think it's better not to do something than have to ask forgiveness for it. Amen? Now, it goes on to read, uh, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. To be steadfast basically means to be immovable, to be sedentary, to be settled. We have to understand, we got to settle this matter. To be steadfast, you have to settle it in your heart, in your mind. You have to settle the fact that it doesn't matter what your personal temptation is, and everybody in here has got different things. Some of, it, some of you guys, it's, it's pecan pie. Uh, okay, well, I'll admit it. Amen, I'll admit it. But, you know, it could be pornography. It could be uh, narcotics. It could be anything. Some people can do things, and to them it's not sin. But if it is sin, then you have to stop it. For some people, uh, not doing things is sin. If God's told you to do something and you don't do it, that's sin. Amen? So it can be actions or it can be lack of actions, depending on what it is we're discussing. But the fact is we're supposed to be steadfast. We're supposed to be immovable in this idea. We have the victory. We have the victory. The sting of death has been stopped. Now, when I was a little kid, I remember walking out in the yard, and ah, something got me on my big toe. And I remember sitting down. I had shorts on. I wasn't wearing shoes. Back in those days, I didn't go. I didn't wear shoes or socks anywhere when I was a kid. And I could run up and down a gravel road. I can't even step on a rock with my shoes on now without me going, <laughs> you know, it yeah, messed me up. But uh, I sat down and I looked at my foot and I realized there was a, a little uh, yellow jacket or a honeybee, I don't know which one it was, something was on, the, on my toe and that hurt more when I realized what it was than it did before. All of a sudden, I, I knew I had been stung by a bee. And uh, when it took off, it left its little stinger in my foot, too. And that freaked me out even more. Ah! You know, I remember running into the house, you know. You wouldn't let my foot touch the floor. And I ran in there, and my mama pulled that little stinger out of my toe and told me to grow up or something. <laughs> It's a wonder she let me in the house. Back when I was a kid, they locked you outside. <laughs> Go outside and play, and then they locked the door. <laughs> uh, well, we had an outhouse, so it wasn't like an emergency. The outhouse was full of mud daubers, which scared the heck out of me, too. I, mean, I don't know if you all ever, ever experienced that, but I never much cared for mud daubers. They don't sting anybody that I know of or do anything, but they just look like they're going to. It's the red wasp you want to watch. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Let's go to a different, different book of the Bible. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read some stuff over here about sin and about getting uh, away from it. Romans chapter 5, verse 19 reads, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness 
to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through the law, sin abounded. But through the grace of God, righteousness abounds. Through God's grace and drawing on the grace of God, understanding that sin has no authority to reign in our bodies, has no authority to reign over us, we are victorious. When we understand and have an understanding of that, we, we understand that by Adam's sin, by one man's sin, by Adam's sinning, he brought sin into the world. By Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sin, he took it. If he took it, then we don't need it. Amen? Why take it back? Why live under the curse of the law? Why live in sin when you can live in grace and in righteousness through the power of Jesus Christ? Chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's not what he's saying at all, is it? He's not saying we continue in sin so we can say, well, you know, we live in an age of grace. We can do anything we want. This is the dispensation of grace. So, you know, just act any way you can because God forgives us and just sin anyway. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, I think the next verse corrects it. Certainly not. I like that. That's strong. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? How can we? Now, we all know how we can because we have, if we're honest. But the question is, why should we? Do you not know that as many as us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as, Jesus, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's supposed to be a new walk. You're supposed to be walking by the Spirit. You're supposed to be walking in righteousness, clothed in righteousness, not walking on the dark side. When I was a young man, and uh, you've heard many of my stories, I don't know if any of you have ever been to New Orleans, but they call it Narlins down in New Orleans. You know, they don't, it's not New Orleans, it's New Orleans, but New Orleans. But anyway, I was in New Orleans. Because I say it right, they don't say it right. Anyway, uh, when I was down there as a young man, we used to, I, I lived in Homa, Louisiana. Everybody ever been to Homa? Nobody? Well, you didn't miss a whole, well, Cheryl has, but nobody, you haven't missed a whole lot. But anyway, it was a pretty good sized town, and, and uh, a lot of oil workers lived there, worked offshore and stuff. And uh, it was about an hour, maybe an hour and a half southwest of New Orleans. And we'd go up every once in a while just to party. We had some friends that lived in New Orleans. They used to live in home, and we'd go up there, and we'd hit, we'd hit Fat City during Lent because the whole town goes crazy. Uh, I mean, it just goes crazy during, during, during Lent, and uh, they, have the, they have the big parades, the Mardi Gras and all that kind of stuff, and you go out and you, you let people throw beads at you and, and doubloons and they're not real, they're just plastic, but they throw these things. They got all these big parades and stuff, and, and it's, it's wild, it's crazy, it's nasty. And, uh, boy, I just reveled in it. I thought this was the greatest thing. Why don't they have this in uh, Scottsburg, Indiana, you know? Why don't they have it where I went to high school? Look at this. Wow, there's half-naked people hanging off balconies and stuff. And it was just like, and you dressed up if you wanted to. So I put a little blue dot on my forehead and said I was a blue dot flash bulb. But... I know. And the young people are going, what the heck is that? But anyway, uh, years later, I get saved. And uh, I'm, I'm in Bible school at Norval Hayes School. And there's a lady there whose husband had died. She was a widow. And she had, him and her had owned like 13 Ben Franklin stores in the Dallas area. So I don't know if you know what Ben Franklin is. It's like a dollar store kind of place. So we, uh, me and uh, my roommate and a friend of hers and then her sister flew in. We were all going to go to Dallas, and we were going to uh, help her settle her state. We thought we were going to be driving cars back because she had a number of cars, but there was some children from a previous marriage that was, you know, 
uh, the man's marriage that was, you know, trying to, you know, get their share. So there was going to be a court thing, and it ended up we got down there, and the whole thing was postponed and canceled. We didn't do anything. But on the way, we stop in New Orleans. And when I went back into New Orleans this time, it was like, Ugh. Ooh. Ooh. this is this is bad. You could just feel a spirit of oppression in the place. Now, I was spirit-filled by then, and, you know, I'm not the greatest at discerning of spirits, but I'm telling you what, that town has a, a bad mojo. It really does. Sometimes it's worse than others, I think, depending on, you know, what the season is. But it wasn't good. Hallelujah. That's the way sin ought to be to us every time we encounter it. The problem is we get callous to it. Once you do something, it's easier to do it again. It's better never to do it at all. But if you do it once, then you might want to, well, you, uh, you, and you get tempted back into it again and again and again and again and again and again. And you don't get born again again. Amen. I've heard people teach that, that you can get born again again. But I think you get born again once and then you slip and you have to ask for forgiveness for that sin. You have to repent. you got to turn around and go the other way. But when you come into sin, it's not what we're supposed to be walking in. We're supposed to be walking in new life. And that new life comes from Jesus Christ. Amen? Reading on, it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That thing's supposed to be put to death, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. The fact is, we don't count ourselves dead. We don't. We, we don't understand the implications of what sin can do. The wages of sin is death. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Amen? There's supposed to be a resurrection in our hearts. Just like Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, when we receive him as our Savior, when our heart has been changed, when our life has been changed, we are supposed to be changed. We are supposed to be living free from sin. Now, if he died, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And that's exactly the way we're supposed to be. Our old man is supposed to be crucified, and we are supposed to be united with him in his likeness, in his righteousness, in this ideal of living for God, living to God. Verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. To reckon means to consider, and actually some translations will say that. Consider yourself to be dead. You've got to have this mind the mind of Christ, that you are free from sin. If you believe that you can't be free, you will not be free. Why do so many people get, get hooked on something and then they never get free? Because they don't see how they can ever be free. They don't have this mind that is right here. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. See, it will reign. It will live there. It will control if you allow it to, but you don't let it do it because you have authority. You have victory. You have the power to stop sin. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So we don't use grace as an excuse to sin. We understand that grace gives us the power not to sin. 
It has no dominion over you. It has no power over you except what you allow it to have. Consider yourself dead to sin. Present your members as instruments of righteousness. Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. So he's repeating this point. There's an error in doctrine that says you can just go ahead and keep sinning and it's okay. It's not okay. And there has to be a punishment of some sort for breaking the law if you put yourself under the law by sinning. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that through you, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered or entrusted. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I, I, I believe he's probably speaking euphemistically to these guys, hopefully to these guys, that that's who they are and where they are. But he wouldn't be telling them all along through so many different passages and ways that they needed to basically present their bodies and reckon themselves and all these things if, if they were really doing it. But we can. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. When I was, when I was younger, some of you know, they used to have this stuff out there called marijuana. I don't know if it's still around or not. Okay, so I know it is out there. But uh, I, I never smoked cigarettes then. And I decided that, hey, I had an opportunity. I was out with some guys, uh, and we smoked some pot. And I got high, and whoa, you know. And uh, I smoked some more and smoked some more. And I said, I'm never going to do any of those other things. Lawlessness leads to lawlessness. And the next thing I knew, I was snorting stuff. I was popping stuff. I was, you know, I had already been drinking. I was already drinking stuff. That might have been the gateway for me. I actually was the drinking because I liked the buzz, you know. I'd been drinking since I was, you know, a teenager, young teenager. And... uh my father, who's now in heaven because he repented, uh, used to supply me with beer, and he'd go to he'd be, he'd buy the cheapest, nastiest, rotten beer. I'd give him money, and he'd bring me Huda Pole <laughs> or Burger Beer. I think that one was made in Cincinnati. I don't know Sterling and Fall City. It was never any of the premium stuff, like Pabst Blue Ribbon. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I used, to, I used to party and have a big time. But what I found from that is one thing leads to another, to another, to another. When I was 13 years old, I went to, we were in a, a little f kind of a junk shop over in, uh, oh, I don't even remember the name of the town, but it's over near Starb Hollow, Valonia. And uh, so I was in Valonia, and uh, I go in there, and there is a stack of old, early 60s Playboy magazines. It's just right here on the shelf. I mean, whoa, whoa. That began a long adventure of mine, if you want to call it that, down the wrong road of liking pornographic magazines. In fact, I said, hey, Mom, can, can I buy these? Okay. I bought myself Playboy magazines when I was 13 years old, 12, 12, 13 years old. They didn't care. It was just part of growing up. That's what boys do, you know. Well, my next birthday, I think when I turned 13... 
my sister bought me a subscription to Playboy magazine. So now I had it coming to my house. I have to say something about pornography. It progresses. Playboy wasn't enough after a while. I needed a hustler. I needed hardcore stuff. You have to stop it because lawlessness leads to lawlessness. One error, one taste of sin develops a taste for more sin or different kind of sin, but maybe within the same family of sins. And you just belly up to the bar and you drink. Verse number 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have them in the things of which you are now ashamed? I know when I tell my stories, it may sound like I should be more ashamed about the things I did, but I tell them to be transparent and let you know you can be set free from any kind of crap that's got a hold of you. For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I'm going to give you three keys, three things to do if you want to stop or you want to stay out of sin. Number one. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Settle it. Settle it. This is a decision of your will. You have to make it an act of your will to stop. You have to quit sinning. You have to make it, I am not doing it anymore. Now, there's things I tried to quit and I couldn't quit. And uh, later on, it, you know... If I, if I did quit it and went back to it, it was even worse. We can quit. You've got to be immovable. You've got to be steadfast. You've got to stop. The second thing you need to do is consider yourself dead to sin. Consider yourself. This is, in the, is an act of the mind. You have to have the act of the will and make a decision and settle it. You are not sinning. And then you have to convince your noggin not to think about it. It has to be an act of the will that you consider yourself dead to sin and you don't consider the things that are sin. You see, you can't consider both. You can't be thinking one thing and then the other. You're double-minded. You don't want to be double-minded, amen? You're unstable in all your ways. You don't want to be unstable in all your ways. You want to have it settled and you want to have your mind right about the whole issue. I am not going to do it anymore. I'm not even going to think about it. I stop thinking about it. The third thing that you do is you present your body to God. Present your members as instruments of righteousness is what he said. He's talking about our bodies. Present your bodies to God. This is an act of the body. It actually follows that if your will and your mind are in unity, your body follows along. Amen? But it's an act of the will and the mind to present your body. We have to present our bodies. We have to say, okay, I'm not doing anything in this body that isn't supposed to be done in this body. Pecan pie or not. Hallelujah. Some people have the Holy Spirit to get them to stop eating stuff like that. I have a wife. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. I have both, actually. Uh, I've cheated on my diet a lot more than she has, you can tell by looking. But, hallelujah, we shall have the victory. Amen. I shall present my members to God. Hallelujah. I have had, had to put my appetite in there, too, I guess, but praise the Lord. Now, you may be thinking, now, why does all this matter? What's the whole point about all this? Well, very simply... The wages of sin is death. That's why. The things that we do, the things that we don't do, put a balance in our account. 
And someday you're going to cash in, and when you do, the wages of sin is death. You don't want to sin. Sin isn't worth not walking in the righteousness, walking in that gift that God has given you of eternal life. It's just not worth it. It just isn't worth it. Now, I'm sure there's people in here who are sinning all over, and we could have a confession uh, time, and everybody stand up and tell us your sins, and then we'll all judge you and sin ourselves as we judge you. But we won't do that today. Instead, what we'll do is I'm just going to allow you to bow your heads, and I'm going to pray for you. And you know what you need to get free from. You know what you need to tell God about. You know what, what holds you back from walking in the newness of life that Christ has provided for you. You know what your stumbling block is, so remove it today. Get it out of your way so that you can move forward in the things of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you, Lord, regardless of how old they are, regardless of what they struggle with, regardless of how long they've been struggling, you can set them free because you already have. You have provided the victory over any and every sin that they may struggle with. Anything that causes them to stumble, we believe you can remove even now in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, as they speak this to you in their heart, their mind, in their voice, however they choose to speak to you right now, I pray that you would set them free, that you would give them the tools to be able to stand steadfast, to be able to act of the will not to sin anymore, that they would have the mind of Christ, that they would think and consider themselves dead to sin so that they can live for God, that they would present their bodies to you, as instruments of righteousness. And I thank you, Lord. I know that they can do it. I pray, Lord, that they choose to today. And if anyone here, Lord God, feels like they can't be free, they've tried, they don't know, they just don't think it'll work, show them otherwise, Lord. Let them hear testimonies about people who've been set free. Let them know that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And we thank you today, Lord God, that no one in here draw their wages from the dark side because that leads to death. We pray, Father, that they will draw from the side of light, the light that is in you, that they might live in you and through your power. I pray that you would minister to them in the name of Jesus, your deliverance and your freedom in Jesus' name. Amen.